you have your Bible, if you'll open it to Daniel 9, um, Daniel 9, 24 to 27 is our main uh, text tonight. And uh, this is one of the most important uh, prophetic sections of the Bible. Um, it's really an indispensable key to all of prophecy. Um, it's been called uh, often the backbone of prophecy, this text has, or sometimes it's called God's prophetic time clock. Um, this prophecy tells us that God has put Israel's future um, on a time clock. You know, it's interesting. People are always trying to set dates, uh, you know, for the end times or the end of the world or the coming of the Lord. And, you know, I, I get all kinds of complicated stuff that people send me all the time. You know, they think they figured out the, the end. They don't know how bad I am at math. They wouldn't send it to me anyway. You know, I couldn't figure it out even if it were true. But people are always trying to, to figure out all these dates. But, you know, this what's interesting. This is the only time prophecy in the Bible. Uh, there is a time prophecy in Scripture, and it gave the, the time of the coming, the first coming of the Messiah. So the Jewish people could know, at least within a, a period of, a, 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 you know, a span of time, when the Messiah was going to come uh, the first time. Now, there are a lot of time periods that are given, you know, like in the book of Revelation, it tells us, you know, that the last half of the tribulation, you know, the, the period of time will be 42 months or three and a half years. I mean, there, there's statements or, or, or spans of time that are given, but this is the only one that's a time prophecy, gives a specific time of when events are going to take place. So for that reason, it's very important. Uh, now, the, the setting of Daniel 9, 24 to 27, which is this great prophecy, it's called of the 70 weeks, is obviously the first 23 verses of chapter 9. And we're not going to take time to, to read all of that or go through it, but you might do that on your own. Um, it's a prophecy that the prophet Daniel gives for his people. Um, look, look at the beginning of it. You'll notice in chapter 9, verse 1, it says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans. This is, of course, when the uh, Medo-Persians overtook the Babylonians. Uh, so he was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans, or what had been the Babylonians. They superseded them. It says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely seventy years. Now, this is an amazing statement. Daniel, the prophet, is reading the prophet Jeremiah um, and what he's written. And he's reading in Jeremiah, and we'll look, at, we'll look at that later, but Jeremiah 25 and also in Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah predicted that the people would go into captivity for 70 years. Well, Daniel knows that that 70-year period has about run out. So he says in verse 3, So I gave my attention to the Lord God, to seek Him by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps His covenant and loving kindness for those who love Him and keep His commandment. We have sinned. Notice he doesn't say they have sinned. You know, about the people of Israel. Now, Daniel, according to the Scriptures, was an upright man. And, you know, the people had sinned and gone into captivity, but he includes himself with them. It says, we've sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly and rebelled, even turning aside uh, from your commandments and ordinances. So he goes through here and he is confessing the sins of the people and he's pleading with God uh, to fulfill his word. Now, what's interesting to me about this is and this is a very important uh, point about prayer. Daniel has just read in the book of Jeremiah that God is going to restore the people after 70 years. Well, so Daniel could have thought to himself, well, God's going to restore him after 70 years. I don't need to pray about it, right? I mean, God's going to keep his word. He's going to do what he says. So why do I need to pray about that? But you'll notice here Daniel is praying according to God's word, according to God's will, that God will do what he says he will do. And I think that's an important lesson for us. You know, the most important thing for you and for me in our prayer life is for us to pray according to God's will. It's the, the, the point of prayer is not to get God to do what I want God to do, but prayer is for me to line up with God and what God wants to do and to pray according to God's will. And the more we come to know Him and the more we read the Scriptures, the more we know what God's will is. So Daniel here is asking God to do the very thing that God has promised to do. I think Daniel knew God would do it. 
but he still seeks after God in this great prayer of uh, confession. And so you get all the way down to verse 19. It says, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and take action. For your own sake, O my God, do not delay, because your city and your people are called by your name. Now, verse 20 says, Now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God, behalf of the holy mountain of my God. He's praying for Jerusalem. He's in Babylon. While I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I'd seen in the vision uh, previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instruction and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplication, the command was issued. And I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. So give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. So while he's still praying, Gabriel shows up and says, Gabriel, or says, Daniel, right when you began to pray, I was dispatched from heaven and I've come here now to give you the understanding uh, that you need. And Daniel is going to be given a, a vision or an understanding now of a, a revelation that's going to go all the way until the second coming of Jesus Christ. So it spans a massive uh, period of time. Now, wouldn't it be great if all of our prayers were like this? Um, every time you were praying, uh, God just came and gave you the answer right then, right then on the spot. I, I haven't had that happen to me very many times, but as I was reading the passage this week, I thought of a time years ago. Uh, Cheryl and I weren't even married yet, and uh, we were, uh, it was a few months before, and we were looking for a house to, to buy together before we got married, and I, so I could go ahead and move in there, and we could go ahead and begin to, you know, move things in there and so on. And anyway, we were looking for a house. I lived in an apartment at the time. We were looking for a house, and uh, you know, that's a big step. I don't know, maybe it isn't for some of you, but for me it was. You know, when you go sign on the line, you got to buy your first house. And we looked at this house, and Cheryl really wanted it really badly. And so I was, I'd been praying about it, though I don't like to do things like that uh, very quickly. My personality on things like that is fairly methodical. So I told her, I said, look, let's pray about it for a couple weeks, and we'll, we'll make this offer. And if it's what God wants us to do, then, then he'll, you know, he'll provide and he'll open the door for it. And I remember it kind of gotten down to that time. And uh, we had a certain amount of money we were going to offer in mind. And, and I was laying, I still remember where I was in this apartment. I was up there and I was laying there on the bed. And uh, I was getting ready to call this fellow who was uh, the, the owner of the house. It was a new house who was, who was building it. I had the phone laying there next to me. And I was praying and I was asking God, you know, if, if this is what you want to happen, you know, this is the amount of money, whatever. I'm sitting there praying and the phone rings. And I pick up the phone and it's him. Now, he's called me. And so we talked for a couple of minutes and I told him what we uh, could give for the house and he accepted it and the whole thing was done. And it was one of those kind of deals. I mean, I just had total peace. I thought, you know, here I am praying and asking God to, to show to me this is what he wants me to do. And I don't even have to call the guy. You know, the guy calls me. And I told him that when I was on the phone with him, too. I said, you know, I was just sitting here just now praying, you know, about this. And... Uh, Anyway, I mean, God doesn't do that for us all the time, but that was one of those things he did for me as a, a young man in my mid-20s and uh, to build our faith. And I've always looked back at that and remembered how God gave me guidance um, in that in my life. But it's not always that way. I mean, a lot of times we pray and we pray and we pour out our heart to God and some things may not be answered for, for years of time. But this is one of those cases where God sent an immediate answer. Now, let me read Daniel 20, uh, 9, 24 to 27. There's a lot in this. We'll go through and look at all of it and break it down where you can understand it. But let me just say, if you really want to understand Bible prophecy, this is a prophecy you need to understand. Um, you may not understand every detail of it, but you need to get this fixed in your mind. Notice in verse 24, it says 70 weeks. This is Gabriel's answer. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Or literally, it's just the most holy. So you're to know and to discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with moat and plaza, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and will have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. 
And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he'll put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. Even until a complete destruction, one that's decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Now, this is a a confusing passage, or it can be. I think if we break it down and go through it step by step, we can uh, understand what it means. Now, let me just give you an overview of it to begin with. And you'll you'll see that if you picked up the outline there on the way in. You have that kind of overview there at the bottom of one side of it. In Daniel 9.24, you have the entire 70 weeks laid out. We'll talk about what that is. Then in verse 25, you have the first 69 of those 70 weeks described. And then in verse 26, you have the gap of time between the 69th and the 70th week. And then in verse 27, you have the last week or one week or what's called the 70th week of this period. So that's a good way to see this. Verse 24 kind of lays out this the whole 70 weeks. Then verse 25 is the first 69 of those 70 weeks. We'll talk about what they are. Then verse 26 is the gap between the 69th and the 70th. And then verse 27 is the the last week that's there, this one week uh, that's left out there. Now, you can see this passage is pretty detailed, so I've broken it down. It's on the outline there for you. I've got 10 keys to understanding uh, this 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel. We'll just go through these one by one. You can see I've even got a chart there on the back that will help us as well to look at this. Now, when it starts out, he says 70 weeks have been decreed. Literally in, uh, in Hebrew, it's uh, 70, uh, 70 sevens or 70 heptads have been decreed. So it's 70 sevens have been decreed for your people. Now, this term week or sets of seven could refer to 70 sevens of uh, days. Could be 77s of weeks. It could be 77s of months or 77s of years. Doesn't tell us what the 77s are. It says 77s or sets of seven have been decreed for your people. Now, obviously, 70 sets of seven would be 490. But the, con- the, the text here doesn't tell us that it's 490 days, weeks, months, or years. So we have to look at the context and what's around this to determine this. Now, there's several reasons why I think the 77s here, the 490 or 490 years. One of the main reasons is if you go back and look at the very beginning of this chapter in chapter nine, verse two, that we were just talking about. uh, God tells us here that Daniel had been reading the book of Jeremiah and reading that the Jewish people were going to be in captivity for 70 years. So Daniel, what is what what time frame is he thinking about as he's praying here? Is he thinking in terms of days or weeks or months? No, he's, he's thinking in terms of years. So right here at the beginning, we know that Daniel is thinking in terms of years. So when he hears about 70 sevens or 70 sets of sevens, to me, I think his mind naturally would go to years. Here's another thing that's really interesting about all this. Turn back to Jeremiah. Uh, 25, and we'll see where this is stated that uh, they're going to go into captivity for uh, for 70 years. And Daniel uh, or, or Jeremiah chapter 25 and uh, verse 11. Jeremiah 25:11 says, "This whole land will be a desolation and a horror, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years." So they're going to go into captivity 70 years. Over in chapter 29 of Jeremiah, 29:10. Uh, says, uh, for thus says the Lord, uh, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. By the way, notice the next verse. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to give you welfare, not for calamity, to give you future and a hope. You know, that verse is quoted very often by people today, right? I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. And I think it's okay for us to make an application of passages like that to ourselves. But we have to remember, this was a passage that was written to the Jewish people and promised to them that they would only be in captivity for 70 years. And then God, in faithfulness to His promise, He says, I know the plan that I have for you. And the plan was for them to be into captivity 70 years. So 
You know, we have to be careful sometimes. We go back and read these passages in the Old Testament and we just say, you know, God says, I know the plans that I have for you, you know, to give you a future and a hope and no calamity. Well, that's not a promise for everybody at, at all points in time. I mean, someone may be a Christian and they may read that and the next day, you know, they may be uh, taken home to heaven in a car accident, you know, or in a plane crash or whatever. You say, well, God said, he, you know, I know the plans he has for you and it's not for calamity, you know, to happen. So we have to be careful in our interpretation of the Bible, but in our application of of that as well. Certainly we can say that the ultimate plans that God has for every one of us as believers, they're good. And it's not to give us ultimate calamity because we're going to be with him. But when we apply it, you know, to every situation in this life, I'm not sure that we can make a a one to one application like that. Now, here's a a really important issue with the Babylonian captivity. Why did the children of Israel go into captivity for 70 years? You know, why not 50 years or 80 years or 20 years? Why 70? There's a passage that gives us the answer to that back in 2 Chronicles 36. And this fits in 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 a very critical way, a very key way with our understanding of uh, the 70 weeks prophecy. Back in uh, uh, 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 36, or I mean Second Chronicles 36, I'm sorry. First Chronicles doesn't have 36 chapters. That's like turn to Mark 17 in your Bible, you know, it's not there. Second Chronicles chapter 36. And uh, let's see, down in verse 21. Notice he says, uh, well, let me begin in verse 20. He says, those who had escaped from the sword, he carried away to Babylon, and they were servants to him and to his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days of its desolation, it kept Sabbath until 70 years uh, were complete. So here's what's important to see. Remember back in, in Judaism, the people were to till the ground and grow their crops, but every seventh year was to be a sabbatical year. You remember that? And they were to allow the grand land to lie fallow. You know, the seventh day of every week was a Sabbath. The seventh year was a Sabbath year. And then, of course, after seven sevens, there was a jubilee year. But what this called on the people to do is they had to trust God. And God promised them that in the fifth and the sixth year before they took that seventh year, that he would give them enough bounty and enough plenty that they would be able to do that and be able to make it. But it, but it called on them to have to trust God to do that. And we all know that, you know, if you've had uh, six really good years, then what was the tendency of the people to do is to say, well, I don't want to let the land just lay here. You know, this year I'm going to go ahead and till the land again. And so he said they went into captivity because they had had, uh, stolen from God 70 of those sabbatical years, 70 of those different years. And they were supposed to have let the land lie fallow. They had not done that. So God basically says, all right, if you're going to insist on killing the ground that seventh year and you're not going to give the ground its rest, I'm going to send you to Babylon. and I'm going to give the land 70 years of rest because you're not going to be here. To me, there's a very important spiritual principle there as well uh, for God's people. And that is you can give to God voluntarily or God can take it from you (laughs) one one way or the other. Um, I'd rather give to God and give him what he's asked me to give. But if we don't give to God, I think God says, look, I'm going to withhold from you. You're going to have lack in your life. It may not be financial, but there's going to be lack in your life spiritually in some way. Uh, There's going to be consequences to stealing from God. And they stole that sabbatical year 70 different times. And God says, you're going to give it to me one way or the other. Now think about this. If every seventh year they were supposed to give God that sabbatical year, and they had stolen 70 of those from God, then what was the total period of time over which they'd stolen uh, a sabbatical year from God? It was 490 years, right? So... That chart you can see on your on your outline there. Notice you've got the 70 year captivity and you see before the 70 year captivity, there had been a 70 times seven or 490 years for them to to use up those 70 sabbatical years. And now in Daniel uh, 9:27, God says, I'm going to tell you now about 490 years in your future. So the 70 year captivity is kind of in the middle of a 490 year time in the past when they'd stolen these 70 uh, sabbatical years from God. 
And so now he's going to talk about, he's going to take uh, them to the future 490 years. That's another reason we know that these 77s are years. They're not weeks or days or months. Um, Because the past from what they'd stolen from God was a 490 year period. So the future will be as well. So that's why I would say that we can know that this is a 490 year period. It's 70 sets of seven years for a total of 490 years. So that's the second point I've got here for us. The total time is 490 years. It's 70 sets of seven years, and it's using the 360-day prophetic calendar uh, that the Jewish people uh, used. Now, the third key thing about the 70 weeks prophecy is it's about the Jewish people in the city of Jerusalem. Again, this, this prophecy doesn't have to do with the church, with the church age that we live in now. Notice, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city. It's for the people, it's Daniel's people, it's the Jewish people, and it's the city of Jerusalem. Um, the archangel Dan, Gabriel told Daniel, this time period is for you. It's for your people and for your holy city. So it's 70 weeks of years, it's 490 years, it's about the Jewish people, the city of Jerusalem. The fourth point here to help us understand this is to look at the purpose of this 70 weeks. Why has God instituted this 70 week or 490 year period in Israel's future? Well, Daniel 9.24 gives us the purpose of this and it's six divine goals that are to be accomplished during this period. And he says that it's to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity. Those first three have to do with man's sin, with the removal of sin. But notice the next three have to do with God's righteousness or bringing in righteousness. It's to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint uh, the most holy. So these are the six things that have to be accomplished during this uh, 490-year period. Now the first one here is to finish the transgression. And there's a definite article there. It's not just to finish transgression. It's to finish the transgression. Now, what was the transgression? The national transgression and rebellion of Israel. What did that ultimately culminate in? Them killing their Messiah. It's to finish the transgression um, of the nation of Israel. By the way, what this implies is that in the future, there has to be a national conversion of Israel. And if you're going to finish the transgression uh, of Israel's rebellion uh, against God then there's going to have to be a convert national conversion of Israel. And that's exactly what the Bible predicts uh, for the future. It says here to make an end uh, of sin, to make an end of sin. And I think, again, this is the sin of the Jewish people. And then he says to make atonement for iniquity. These same three words are used in Daniel chapter nine, verse five, when Daniel's confessing their sins. Same Hebrew words, we've sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and your ordinances. Now, whenever, uh, I don't want to get this too complicated here uh, tonight, but there's a big difference between the way someone like like myself takes this 70 weeks prophecy and someone who is uh, like the amillennialists and others. They believe that all of this was fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus. They would say that he finished the transgression. He made an end of sin by dying on the cross. Um, He made atonement for iniquity. So all of this was fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus. And they take this whole 70 weeks prophecy as having already been fulfilled. They don't see a future element to it. But here's the problem I see with that. At the first coming of the Messiah, he did die on the cross, obviously, for the sin of the world. And he made provision for sin. But Israel's application of this will not be realized until the Messiah comes again. I mean, the transgression of Israel has not been finished. Uh, The sin of Israel has not been made an end of. So the application of this won't be realized to the end. But these next three, to me, are difficult to see as having been fulfilled in Christ's first coming. One of the purposes of the 70 weeks in in this second set is to bring in everlasting righteousness. Has everlasting righteousness been brought in yet? I don't think so. I mean, I think that looks ahead to the Messianic kingdom. When Messiah comes, at the end of this 70 weeks, it's going to bring in everlasting righteousness. It's going to seal up vision and prophecy. Um, they would say, well, Christ's first coming, you know, the prophecy all about Him was fulfilled, but it's to seal up all vision and prophecy. Still a lot of prophecy to be fulfilled. 
But at the end of this period of time and the second coming of Jesus comes, uh, prophecy and vision will be sealed up at that time. It will be finished. And then the, the final one is to anoint the most holy place. And they would say the most holy there just means Jesus, the Messiah. It's to anoint Him. But I take the most holy place here refers to a future temple uh, that's going to be anointed. So you can see how people take these things differently. But um, I, don't, I don't see any way for all of this to have been fulfilled at the first coming of Christ. And we'll see that a little bit further um, as we go along here. But this is the purpose of the 70 weeks is for these six things to be fulfilled uh, during this period of time. Now, the sixth point I have, or the fifth one here, to help us understand this, is to ask, okay, when does the clock start ticking? When did this 70 weeks start? I mean, obviously, if it's 70 sets of seven years or 490 years, we need to know when it starts. So beginning in verse 25, we get the, 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 the beginning of this. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, Until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. So we read here that the divine prophetic clock, if you will, for Israel started ticking when there was a decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. Now, in Judaism, there was three different ideas about when this started, and that's why they didn't know exactly when the 69 weeks were up. They didn't know when to start it. Some started it with Cyrus. Remember, he made a decree for the Jews to go back and rebuild their temple in 538 B.C. Uh, There was a second decree by Artaxerxes that let Ezra go back. You Remember, in 457 B.C. And then the final one was Artaxerxes made a decree in March of 444 B.C. that allowed Nehemiah to go back and rebuild the city. And I think that's the one that started this because it says... That's going to be a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. The Cyrus decree gave them a right to go back and rebuild the temple, but they didn't build the city. When Ezra went back, there really wasn't any rebuilding at all. It was more to go back and restore the people back to God. But Nehemiah, you remember, in Nehemiah chapter 1 and 2, he wanted to go back and rebuild the walls of the city. He's the one that built it. So scholars who know a lot about these kinds of things... uh, believe that it was March the 5th of 444 B.C. It's when the artist, his name was Artaxerxes Longimanus made a decree that allowed Nehemiah to go back. So that's when this time period of the 70 weeks started ticking, I believe. March the 5th of 444 B.C. By the way, these kind of things are interesting. I mean, you think about all that was going on in the world on March the 5th of 444 B.C. and probably wasn't a person... Uh, around other than, than some of the people who knew Scripture who probably had any ideas a day like any other day. How many times do days go by, you know, in our lives when God is doing something dramatic and we don't know about it? But God is, was, was bringing something to bear um, in the world at that time that had great significance. And so he says here, from the time to, that this decree is issued until Messiah the Prince... There will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, seven plus 62 is 69. So that's the first 69 of these sevens. Now, seven weeks is 49 years and uh, 62 weeks is 434 years. Put those together and it's 483 years uh, of time. So he says, look, from March the 5th of 444 B.C. until Messiah the Prince comes, it's going to be 483 years. Now, if you take 483 years and, and put it into the Jewish prophetic calendar, and you have, to, you have to make account for leap years and all this kind of stuff. By the way, there's a great book, if you like this kind of stuff, by uh, Dr. Harold Honer. He taught at Dallas Seminary for years. Um, he went home to be with the Lord just about a year ago. Um, he was one of my uh, readers on my uh, dissertation. Gave me great uh, consternation over all the footnotes and stuff. He's like the world's greatest expert on Turabian, like in the world. I mean, he can quote Turabian like the Bible, you know. Uh, but I love Dr. Honer, great guy. I mean, the most meticulous guy. But it's a book called Chronological Aspects of the Life of Christ. And Dr. Honer is the leading scholar, really, who's worked on this. Now, there was a book years ago, a lot of you probably heard of, called The Coming Prince by Sir Robert Anderson. And that was kind of the standard work on the 70 weeks for many years. But Dr. Honer came along, and he believes that Robert Anderson made some mistakes. And uh, one time my friend Tommy I said he asked Dr. Honer if anyone had ever been able to refute um, his 
uh, statistics and all of his findings, you know, scholars that are out there looking at this, he said no one ever had. Now, 483 uh, prophetic years is 173,880 days. Now, 173,880 days, if you go from March the 5th of 444 B.C., I mean, taking in leap years and everything and figuring all that out, and you go 173,880 days, it's March the 30th of 33 A.D. And that is the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem for his triumphal entry. And he says, from a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. And that was the day, remember, they were hailing him, you know, Hosanna, you know, save now, you know, son of David. That's when they were recognizing him as Messiah the Prince. And that's why I call this 70 weeks prophecy the greatest prophecy that has ever been given. I mean, to, you know, to, to prophesy something that's going to happen next Monday, you know, or, or tomorrow, you know, would be amazing. But the specificity of this prophecy um, is, is really it's, it's staggering. And, of course, Jesus knew about it, obviously. Look over in Luke 19. I mean, Luke chapter 19. There's a significant statement here that's made by Jesus in Luke chapter 19. Down in uh, verse 27. Jesus, uh, Jesus says, But these enemies of mine who don't want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. As after he'd said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he'd appro- approached Bethpage and, and uh, Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples ahead. And then you have the whole story here of the, of the triumphal entry um, of the Lord. And then down in uh, verse 41, it says, When he approached Jerusalem, uh, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw a barricade against you, surround you and hem you in on every side. They'll level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Notice what what he says, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. And it was the very day, Jesus in verse 42, notice says, if you had known in this day, even you, the things that make for peace. What he's telling them, I think, at that point is this day right here was a visitation. This is the day of your visitation. You didn't recognize it, the, the significance of it. So on that day, this prophecy, this first 69 weeks is fulfilled. And this stands as monumental proof of the inspiration of the Bible. I and mean, if this was the only prophecy you had in the Bible, or at least in the book of Daniel, you would say Daniel uh, is, is, is one who was inspired uh, by God. Now, I believe the book of Daniel was written by the prophet Daniel in the 6th century B.C. Um, we're going to talk about this quite a bit next week when we get to Daniel 11, another incredible prophecy. But even if Daniel were written later by somebody else in the 2nd century B.C., which all these critics say, this would still be a, a, a astounding prophecy. It's still, you know, a, a couple hundred years away before it's fulfilled um, at that period of time. I mean, the, the, the 444 date would have already come and gone, but the end of it would not have. So this is a, an amazing prophecy. Now, the next thing we need to see in verse 26 is what I call the gap called grace. Because you notice it says in verse 26 that after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. So the first 69 weeks of years go, went from May the, or March the 5th, 444 B.C. To, uh, April, to, to March the 30th of A.D. 33. That was the day Jesus rode into Jerusalem on His triumphal entry. So the 69th week came to an end. And then it says, after that, the Messiah is going to be cut off and have nothing. Well, it was after that. It was just a few days later. It was uh, uh, April the 3rd of 33 A.D. The Messiah was cut off. And this means he was he was violently killed. Um, He was cut off and will have nothing. I mean, it's a this is a prediction, obviously, of the crucifixion of Israel's uh, Messiah. And then it says, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end will come of the flood. Even to the end, there'll be war. Desolations are determined. So what it's telling us is, look, once that 69th week ends with with Messiah, the prince, there's going to be a gap of time. And he tells us two things are going to happen in that gap. One of them is the Messiah is going to be killed, and the other one is the city of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. 
Now that gap has gone on now for almost 2,000 years. But he tells us at least a couple things uh, that are going to happen here during this gap or this parenthesis or whatever term uh, you want to use for it. Now this is where a lot of the uh, people who disagree with our view get really upset because we see this long gap of time here. But notice there's already a gap of at least 37 years because from 33 A.D. to the destruction of Jerusalem was 37 years. So there's a gap here of some length of time. It's just that it's gone on now for almost 2,000 years. Uh, But I think you have to have a gap here because you can't make the words of verse 27 really fit into any um, other historical events. By the way, in, in, in the past, remember that 490 years before during those sabbatical years when they were robbing God of those sabbatical years? There were gaps back there in that period of time as well. And it wasn't just one sabbatical year after another they stole from God. There were gaps back there as well. So we should, you know, it shouldn't be strange to think of a gap in the future as well. So what I think happened is this. God started to put, put, he put Israel on the clock, if you will, for this 490 year period on March the 5th of 444 BC. And the clock stopped, if you will, on, uh, on Mar- March the 30th of, of AD 33. At the end of that 69th set of seven years, God kind of stopped the clock, if you will, temporarily. And we are living in that gap of unspecified duration during the six, between the 69th and the 70th week. And this time period is known as the church age, or it's known as the mystery. It's this age in which we live, in which God is calling now Jews and Gentiles into one body, something that was never, never prophesied in the Old Testament. Um, so it's kind of like He's put the program for Israel on hold. It's, it's in suspension until now uh, this church age Uh, runs its course. And then someday, I believe, the church age will end just as it began suddenly. The church age will end. The church will be raptured to heaven. And then the 70th week, that one week that's still out there is going to begin. But remember, these 70 weeks have to do with Israel. They don't have to do with the church. Here's a very important argument for pre-trib rapture. If the church, if the church wasn't here on earth and the church didn't exist during those first 69 weeks, then why would we be here on earth during the 70th week? You see the point I'm making? We, the church didn't exist for the first 69. We weren't here on earth. Why would we be here for that final week, the 70th week? It has to do with Israel. So to me, that's an argument that we won't be here during the 70th week. Uh, we will have been uh, caught up to heaven uh, to be with the Lord. So there's this unspecified period of time, but then verse uh, 27 gives us our eighth point here, which is Antichrist's treaty in the final seven years. Because notice it says, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. Now, 69 of those weeks have already taken place. How many of them does that leave left? Just one. And this is the only place in the Bible that we find a reference to a period of seven years that we get the whole idea that the tribulation is going to be a seven year period. This is the only place in the book of Revelation you have repeated several times the the idea of 1,260 days or 42 months or time, times, and half a time. Those are synonyms, all three of those statements, for three and a half years. And I think in the book of Revelation, it always looks at the last three and a half. But where does that, that period of three and a half years in the book of Revelation, where did John get the time period of three and a half years? It's half of seven. So we're going to see here this seven-year period is divided into two halves. So that's where this whole idea of, of a seven-year tribulation and two halves divided into three and a half each, that's where it comes from, is from this passage. So that's why this text is so important, is this is the passage that tells us there's a future time out there when God is going to deal with Israel again uh, that's a period uh, of seven years. So God's prophetic clock for Israel will begin to run again after the church has been raptured to heaven. Now, the, there's big controversy over who the he is in verse 27. He will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. Um, all your amillennialists and all them, they make the he here Jesus. That Jesus came and uh, made the, the covenant that God had made, uh, the, the new covenant. He, he made that covenant prevail. But the problem is, you know, how was the covenant cut off after three and a half years? And, you know, talks about he'll put a stop to sacrifice. They'll say, well, when Jesus came and died on the cross, we didn't need Old Testament sacrifices anymore. 
But how did Jesus make the covenant for, for seven years? I mean, what, what, is that, what does the seven years have to do with anything in the life of Jesus? So the, the problem is that it doesn't fit the details. And here's the big problem. The he, what's the nearest antecedent to the word he? I mean, when, you know, in grammar, when you find a pronoun, uh, you're, you know, you're trying to figure out who it is. What do you look back? You look to the nearest antecedent to that to find out who the he is. Well, the he here, if you look in verse 26, the last person mentioned is, it says, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city. Its end will come. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one year. Who will make the covenant? The prince who is to come. It's the Antichrist, the, the little horn, the beast, whatever word you want to give for him. He's going to come and make a covenant with the many, that is the many in Israel, uh, for one week of years. And so the word uh, firm here, by the way, firm covenant can mean literally a compelled covenant or a forced covenant. Or it can mean he makes a covenant prevail. In other words, it could be a covenant that already exists and he just comes and makes it strong or firm or brings it into uh, bring, brings it to where it really is, is, is taking hold. So it could be a covenant that already exists. It could be a con- compelled covenant. We're really not sure exactly what this means. But one of the things, obviously, for this to be fulfilled in the end times, you have to have Israel back in their land, right? I mean, the Antichrist or this prince who is to come, he can't make a firm covenant with the many in Israel if the Israel doesn't exist. That's why we always say that Israel is the super sign of the end times. They have to be back uh, in their land. And to me, it's fascinating. I mean, Israel is established as a nation in 1948, making a covenant like this possible for the first time in 1900 years. And I mean, I was just watching the news before I I came up here this evening and they're talking about, well, you know, President Obama met with, you know, Mahmoud Abbas today. And, you know, they're trying to see if they can get the peace press peace uh, process restarted, you know, again over there or whatever. I mean, that's what all that's been talked about since 1948. Um, there have been there's never really been peace over there. There's just been brief respites where there's not any war is basically all you have. And what does the world want? I mean, what what would be the greatest feather in the cap of any American president they could ever possibly get to bring some kind of lasting peace over there to that problem or, or to any politician in the world? And that's why I think when the Antichrist comes on the scene, the Bible says he's going to rise out of a reunited Roman Empire. And he comes on the scene and he's able to bring some kind of a forced peace or or a prevailing peace or whatever there. He's going to be hailed as the greatest peacemaker in world history. Probably will be, you know, Times Man of the Year and get the Nobel Peace Prize and all kinds of things. But he's going to come on the scene as a great peacemaker to begin with. And we can see today how the world is set up for this. Um, I was reading uh, the other day Ahmadinejad, the Iranian president, um, after, you know, that Gaza, you know, they tried to get that flotilla in there and the, the, the Jewish uh, Navy stopped it. He said this after that, but he called the Jewish uh, soldiers their wild dogs. And he said, a storm of anger from all the nations of the region will uproot you. So I'm interesting because Ezekiel 39, 9, or 38, 9 says it's, they're going to come like a storm on the land of Israel. It says a storm from the nations of the area uh, are going to uproot you. So, you know, the stage is set today for a a great leader from Europe to come on the scene and to give Israel uh, some kind of guarantee um, of security. And you notice uh, then the ninth point we have here, though, at the midpoint of that seven year period, that final one week, he's going to break it, break the treaty. Notice in verse 27, he'll make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, three and a half year point, he'll put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. Now, if he's going to put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, what does that mean they have to be doing? They have to be offering. Now, where's the only place the Jewish people are going to offer sacrifice and grain offering? It's in the temple. This is one of the passages, I I think, passages that necessitates a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem during the time of the tribulation. Now, when will that temple be built? We don't know. We know it has to be built sometime before the middle of the tribulation because for him to stop sacrifice at the midpoint, it has to have been going on sometime before that. Well, we really don't know. I mean, it could be before the rapture, could be early in the tribulation. We really don't know. But evidently, whatever this, this treaty is, it seems to somehow give the Jewish people 
uh, the right to have their temple there and to, and to reinstitute sacrifices there. Now, that is one of the thorniest problems in all of Bible prophecy. How are the Jews ever going to rebuild a temple up there on that 40 acres on the Temple Mount where you've got the, you know, the Dome of the Rock and you've got the Al-Aqsa Mosque, you know, the third most uh, holy site in, in, in Islam? And, uh, you know, people say, well, that's impossible. That's ever going to take place. And a lot of people will say that there's a place there on the Temple Mount that where the old temple was, they'll be able to, they can build that right next to the Dome of the Rock and where the Al-Aqsa Mosque is. But I don't think the Jews would want that and neither would, neither would Islam. Now you can say, well, maybe Antichrist is going to come force it. I'm not an expert in this, but my friends who are, you know, tell me that the place that they're going to have to build the temple is going to have to be where the Dome of the Rock is, or at least part of it is. And, you know, the Jewish people, over there, they know where the temple was. And you say, well, how's this ever going to happen? I don't know. Uh, people say, well, it's impossible. Well, that's what they said about the Jews coming back to their land, too, and they're there. So it'll happen somehow. You know, will there be a great earthquake? It could be that Gog and Magog takes place. All these Islamic nations pour into Israel. In Ezekiel 38, it says God wipes their armies out. Well, after their armies are all wiped out, Israel could go do whatever they want on the Temple Mount. Uh, we don't know how it's going to take place, but somehow or other God's going to overcome this insurmountable problem, and uh, they're going to be able to rebuild uh, their temple there, and the Antichrist is going to break this treaty. So this is going to be one of the great double crosses of all time where the Antichrist has guaranteed their security and he, he terminates this covenant with Israel at the midpoint. And so this seven-year period is broken into these two halves of three and a half years. Now again, when you go to the book of Revelation, over and over again, you have this three and a half year period talked about. Now again, where, where did John get this idea of three and a half years? It's from this passage. And I take it in the book of Revelation, when that three and a half years is mentioned, it's always that last half or the great tribulation uh, that's going to come. So there's a lot in this prophecy, as you can see. I mean, a lot of, of things that have to be uh, fulfilled and come about. Uh, but the tenth point I have here is the end of the 70th weeks, of the 70 weeks. At the end of the 70th set of seven years, God is going to slay the Antichrist. Notice it says he'll put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. And this may refer here to the abomination of desolation. You know, the Antichrist, one of the things he's going to do, according to 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, is he's going to come sit in the temple of God and declare that he is God. Now, he can't stay there to be worshipped all the time. He can't stay sitting in the temple. So the first phase of this abomination of desolation is him sitting there declaring he's God. But the second phase is this beast or false prophet that helps out the Antichrist is going to come and make an image of the Antichrist and put it there in the temple in the Holy of Holies so it can sit there permanently. And that's the, the second phase of this abomination of desolation. So phase one will be the man of sin himself sitting there. Phase two will be this image of him sitting there. But then it says, notice at the end of this, until uh, the end will come, uh, until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the desolator. So this one who's come and desolated the temple, destruction's going to be poured out on, uh, on that desolator. And of course, that's what's going to take place when Jesus Christ comes. And so that'll be the end of this 70 sets of seven. So God has told the Jewish people, look, there's 490 years basically until we're going to seal up vision and prophecy, till we bring in everlasting righteousness, uh, till uh, there's atonement made for iniquity. We're going to finish the transgression. 483 of those years came and, and, and went at, at the time of the, around the death of Jesus. Now we live in this long, unspecified time or gap or parenthesis or whatever word you want to use for it. But there's one week of years still out there in the future that's going to be fulfilled. Now, someone might ask, well, how do we know that that one week that's out there is really going to be literally fulfilled as a seven-year period? Well, how were the 483 fulfilled? Literally. Exactly. To the very day. And it was a 483-year period. So we have every right, then, I think, as we read this to say, that one week of years, that seven-year period, is, has to be fulfilled just as precisely and just as accurately. And, you know, to me, this is what gives us so much confidence in the Bible is 
You know, God has brought a prophecy that was 173,880 days to the day to fulfillment. So we don't have any doubt that that seven years is still out there somewhere uh, when God is going to bring it to pass. So you can see on this chart, you may have looked at that already, but this chart kind of lays the whole thing out for us. You know, there's the decree to restore on March 5th, 444 B.C., Artaxerxes' decree in Nehemiah 2, 1 to 8. Then you have those first 69 weeks. Then you have Messiah the Prince um, on March 30th of A.D. 33. That's the triumphal entry. Then in this gap, we have Messiah cut off. That was on April 3rd of A.D. 33. Uh, We have the city and the temple destroyed. That was August the 6th of A.D. 70. And then it's continued to go on now into the church age. But someday the rapture is going to take place. The church is going to be out of here. And then that last seven year period starts when this prince who is to come, the beast, the little horn, the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, and a lot of names for him, when he comes and makes this covenant or treaty with Israel. That's what starts that final week of years. And I know I've mentioned this before, I'm pretty sure in here, but the rapture doesn't start the tribulation. It's the signing of this covenant. That's what starts the seven years. So, you know, the rapture could happen today and the covenant may be signed in a month or a year or two years from now. There could be probably will be some period of time in there when further preparation. But when that treaty is signed, uh, then, you know, uh, that the, the final tribulation is beginning. Uh, someone asked me one time, you know, they're saying, well, you're pre-trib rapture and you, know, you could be wrong. And well, when are you going to admit you're wrong about the pre-trib rapture? I said, look, if I'm here when the man of sin comes on the scene, signs that seven year covenant with Israel, I'll admit that I'm wrong at that point in time uh, when that take, if, if that were to take place. Uh, but that's what's going to uh, come in the future uh, with this. And, you know, to me, when we uh, think about uh, this prophecy that was fulfilled so precisely Uh, with the first coming of Jesus Christ, um, we can know that uh, this final future visitation of Christ that He's prophesied is going to occur right on time, exactly according to God's uh, schedule as well. And so my prayer tonight is, I mean, this is a a lot of stuff. I know some of you all probably know quite a bit about this. If you didn't know anything about the 70 weeks before we came in here, you know, uh, you may be trying to digest all of this. But hopefully the way we can break it down into verse 24, 25, 26, 27, hopefully you can see this because this is one of the great apologetics for the Bible, for the truth of the Bible. You know, I mean, this is a great thing. If you ever come across somebody who doesn't believe the Bible, this is a pretty good place to take them to. And to tell them, look, you can put this to the test. Go read books. Figure out the dates for yourself. Do it whatever. It's, it's a wonderful apologetic for the truth of the Bible. Uh, but also, it's a, a key passage to really understand Bible prophecy. Where do we get the idea of a seven-year time out there? Where do we get the idea of it starting with some kind of peace treaty or whatever? This is the passage. And so I think it's rightly been called the backbone of Bible prophecy. I think it was H.A. Ironsides, one of the guys who gave it that name. Because really, if you don't understand a passage like this, you really don't understand some of the real basics um, of the prophetic Scripture. Now, next time, I want to go to Daniel 11. And uh, I call uh, Daniel chapter 11 the prophecy that most people don't believe. And uh, we'll talk about this incredible uh, chapter next time. Uh, Let's let's close in prayer together. Father, we come before you tonight and uh, we are humbled as we read uh, here in Daniel chapter nine of Daniel, uh, the great man of God uh, coming before you and uh, praying really your word back to you and confessing his sin, this upright, godly man, confessing his sin and pouring out his heart before you. God, I pray that you would reveal to us uh, the iniquity and the sin and the transgression that's in our lives and that we would be broken over it. Uh, Father, that we would intercede for ourselves and our families, but even like Daniel, for our nation as well. Father, thank you for this revelation that you gave to him so long ago, much of which we can see fulfilled. Father, there's still that one week of years out there. Father, we await that time when The Lord Jesus will come and end this church age and catch us up to be with Himself. And then these events will begin to unfold. Father, that's our hope. May it be soon, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.